Okay, let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the beautiful day we have. We thank you for being able to see the sun that really does exist. And we thank you for bringing its uh, shining light upon us this day. And help us to remember as we go through our study that Jesus Christ is the true light of the world and that he has come to warm our hearts, bless our lives, and guide us to the shores of, of eternal glory. Bless our study this day in the name of Christ our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. I'm always one who, uh, when, when a question's asked, first of all, questions ask, and I'm one of these guys that has to ponder it for a while. Do you have to do that? I mean, when somebody says something, I, I listen and I respond, but then I always go back and I ponder and reflect. Okay, that's me. And then I come back. And so Rick asked a question last week, and it didn't bother me at all. It was a very good question. If I got this right, it was about how do you deal with evil, like the insects, that you have the infestation of the uh, locusts in, in Joel, and that's, and that's destroying of the crops, okay? But then the question goes, so if you see evil going on in the world and God's using it for something else, does that mean you don't address it and say, well, God's working? Or do you address it? And the question, the answer is, you always address evil when it exists, because God wants us to, to do that. But what, what, we, what I want to understand today is this concept that even if we address evil, and evil is not dealt with as we think it should, God's still working. This is the important, God's still working. It doesn't have to go the way we think it has. So you've got King Herod, right? You got this mean king. In, if, in, the, uh, in the 21st century, he would uh, enjoy the concept of abortion, okay? Because he killed all these to, to get rid of Jesus. But he was on that throne for that very purpose. Sounds really foolish. He's on that throne for that purpose to issue the decree that all male children two years old and younger would be put to death because that was going to the sign that this child that was born was the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. <gasps> Dang, it blows your mind, okay? And, and, and it's like uh, when Jesus is on the cross, okay, and, and the other two criminals are alive yet, they bust their legs. They come to Jesus. Oh, he's already dead. So they don't break his legs to try to increase or hurry up with suffocation, but they put a sword to his side. Oh, two prophecies fulfilled about the Messiah. His bones will not be broken and his side will be pierced. And they think they got everything under control. And there's God up there smiling saying, hey, the prophecies concerning the Messiah wouldn't have been fulfilled. Okay, so I want to just look at two passages quick to emphasize this. We, we are responsible for confronting evil and, and addressing evil, but that doesn't mean we can change people's hearts or lives. It's, it's, a, it's a very frustrating thing, and you may even have that really close to home with some of your own kids. And you say, oh, man, if just somebody, uh -huh. and you just pray that uh, there will come a time when everything will get straightened out. But anyway, Romans chapter 8, if you turn there, this is, so I, I'm just, because of this locust thing. Now, this was locust. This is just insects. So it's not as a big a thing as a ruling from the government or whatever you might say. But, um, but we, so, so we still stand up for human life. We stand up for uh, the right to life. Uh, we stand up for, uh, against euthanasia. Okay? Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's going to go the way we want to. But in, in J Romans 8, 28, um, very familiar passage. And this is, this is called the suffering chapter of Scripture. If you look at 18, it starts out, For I consider that the sufferings of this present life are not worth being compared to the glory that's revealed in us. But verse 28, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, what are all things? Are good and evil. All things, whether they're good or evil, from man's perspective, I mean, or even God's perspective, 
All things work together for good. God takes the bad, and he will work it out for good. Okay? Simple and plain as that. Okay? So not all things are good, but he will take all things and work them out for good. And that, that's the sovereignty of God, okay? That's God having this eternal plan. And, and what it's meant to do for us is, yes, we still deal with evil. That's our job, to confront sin and to speak against sin. But at the same time, it is our comfort and the certainty that everything's okay as we are under the grace of God and Jesus Christ, okay? And so the last, the other verse I want to look at is uh, Ephesians 1. <clears throat> Again, this is a, this was my pondering. So I always, I really do appreciate questions because I always, that's why I've always liked adult, teaching adults better than com compliments. Compliments, they just sit there and they look at you and, <laughs> and, and, and getting questions and, and, and doing research or why is this or why is that, I love doing that, okay. So anyway, Ephesians 1, he's talking to God's people, Paul is, and he writes beginning at verse 15 of chapter 1 on page 976 of my Bible. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love toward all the saints, so good, strong Christians, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So he's saying, I, I, I am praying that you may grow and see things better from the perspective of God than from the perspective of man, okay? Um, I, and I don't know, again, like where you stand politically. I don't really want to get into that. But what I get really ticked off at is God tells us a house divided cannot stand. There is no possible way the United States is going to stand if everybody's bickering against the other person. I, I mean, right? We're, we're forgetting our focus. It's kind of like in the church, if you, if you start arguing amongst yourselves, you forget, wait a minute, I'm a brother and sister in Christ. The enemy is Satan and the evil world, not, not the people across the aisle from me, okay? So anyway, so he says, that you may have a spirit of wisdom and revelation, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Now notice this, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. The Lord wants us in all situations to have the hope in the salvation that is ours through Jesus Christ. And that as it says in Re Revel ah, Revelation, Romans chapter 8, nothing in all the world can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. They can take, the government can all of a sudden say there will be no more Bibles in the United States. That can't take our faith away. Okay. But the important part is that's why we should be studying the word so that it's in here, right? That, that they can't take it away. Okay. Um, in the, to hope which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Remembering what is ours for certain, heaven. What, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? Now listen to this. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. So he's speaking now. Remember, Christ rose. He conquered death, the grave. He sits at the right hand of the Father for what reason? Far above all hu rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things, okay, good and evil, under his feet and gave him as the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills in all. All in all. And so the concept here is God, Jesus, and I find this interesting. I don't, I don't know. I, you don't have Ascension Day services here, do you? You used to, okay. And St. Paul still does, but it is the worst attended worship service. <laughs> huh? Yeah. And, when, and, and that's my point. And it's really important because the Ascension of Jesus says, 
He rules. He governs all things for the sake of his people. Oh, I don't want to listen to that. I got a ball game to go to. <laughs> See, it's really interesting. The very thing we have our hope in that he's governing all things, we neglect this on Ascension Day. Yeah. Yeah. And we actually at Bremen, we moved it because one time we had, we used to have it on Thursdays, and then we had a mass exodus after the kids sang because there were ball games. So I said, okay, let's make it Ascension Eve. Wednesday night is still considered a little bit, getting worse, uh, as, as church night in Bremen. So, okay, but here he is, he's saying, I'm governing all things for the sake of the church, for the sake of his people. And that's our assurance. We still deal with evil, and we might see, feel like we're losing battles, but the war's already won. Satan is defeated. Evil, in the end, will be addressed and will be done with. That's our hope. And so we just remain steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's our confidence. We trust that. Yeah. And we also trust God that... He, he will, if we just are, if we just share the word. I, I met with a, I've had four different circuit visitor meetings. This, this has been a bad month for me to make all these calls and <laughs> phone up because I've been doing circuit. I met one with a pastor yesterday, and I, I was telling him, I said, you know, there was an episode in Bremen where I, uh, a member had a father-in-law who was an atheist. And he said to, she said to me, would you go and visit him? Okay, so I knock on the door and I say, I'm Pastor Rody from St. Paul's Lutheran Church and I'd like to talk to you. If you want to talk to me about God, I don't want you in this house. I said, okay, we won't talk about God. We won't talk about Jesus. We won't talk about any of that. For two weeks, I visited him like three times a week and finally got comfortable with me. And so one day he had a nickname and I said, so, Today, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. Now, if you don't want me to, I won't. He didn't stop me. We visited for five and a half months. He was dying of cancer. Five and a half months. And now he was bedridden. And I was visiting him, and he folded his hands. He said, Pastor, I would like to thank the Lord today that he came to die for my sins, and I'm going to heaven. And two weeks later, he died. So again, it, it seemed like evil, and, and we have to, but so you, you do what you have to do in order to work, and but God's, my point is God's got the power through the Spirit to do great things. I mean, this, and in this whole process, then his wife joined the church because she sat in, in some of the conversations, and she said, I'll take adult instruction class, bango, bango, bango. I mean, it really, but the, the concept is we address evil. We have to address evil. And if somebody says, oh, I know what you're going to say about homosexuality, I won't say that to them necessarily, but I'll go back home and say, I know that's a good thing. They know where I stand. That's okay. That's okay. I didn't say I didn't love them. I didn't say I didn't care about them. Uh, they can see if I love and care about them, but at least they know where I stand. Okay? Yeah. Anyway, any comments on that now? I thought I would just address that because I just... I felt better if I did. That's a, I did it for me. It's a very selfish, self-centered concept. <laughs> but it is, it is our hope. You know, God still, I mean, who do you want? Uh, I, could, I, could, I know a very popular uh, former governor who would probably say, you know, this election year, well, neither of them are good presidential candidates. But you got to vote for one. And the, 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 see, it's just, it's, it's just interesting, right? I mean, this, I've heard this for s several years now. Well, <laughs> I don't really want to vote for either one, but one's not as good as the other, so I'll, I'll take the lesser of two evils. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you're right, yeah. Right. <laughs> a 
I get yes, I get you. And I, I was when I was getting ready this morning, I was thinking there I don't know if any of you remember Pastor Ed Nickel. That was Pastor Jim Nickel's father. But I remember him once when he was alive, he said to us, he said, You know who needs to be the president of Synod? The guy who doesn't want the position. Because then he will do what he's supposed to do. And I was thinking about that in, in, in presidential elections and the it's like a popularity race, right, kind of, and financial and all this stuff. But anyway, the, the concept is these people evidently want to do this, but if they really, if they want, if they if you want a good president, they want to do it for the people, just for the people, right? And, and then they don't care what the results are because they're going to do what they need to do for the sake of the people. That's all, uh, yes, yes, yes. So anyway, uh, we keep them in a prayer. Yeah, because in in in, ter in First Timothy it talks about pray for your kings or your presidents. And Romans thirteen is very interesting because it says God puts on the throne those that He wants there at the time. See, and they. Yeah. Okay, do you have another comment, Rick? You, are you thinking again? You're still thinking. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, uh, just to share with my son, because, of course, he had to run for election, and I asked him once, I said, so how come there are Republican and Democrat judges in Indiana? Because the law is the law. It doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat. He said, well, Indiana has the division. There are some states that don't recognize Republican and Democrat. But he, <laughs> but he said, I hate politics. Uh, he, he hated, and the guy that he ran against changed from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. I don't know if I told you this. And he, he was belonged to John's church, and all of a sudden he w was on the school board. He attended church, da-da-da-da. He hadn't been doing that. And uh, John said, I'm not going to say anything bad about it. The only thing I'm going to say is I've been a Republican all my life. <laughs> so he, that's all he said. <laughs> but anyway, so these guys ripped him apart. The day after he won the election, he had over 300 phone calls from people who had tore him apart, who now wanted to be his best friend, that he might do something, give him a job. And he said, I cannot stand these people. They are, they are hypocrites. <laughs> and he just does not like, he watches it, but he doesn't like it. Well, that's uh, and in Bartholomew co County, where John ran, see they elect Republicans. So the guy moved from Democrat to Republican Party. But as soon as he lost, he removed himself from the school board of the church. He never longer attended that church again. It just it was everything was geared toward getting elected. Yeah. And and see that's and th John just says that's a two-faced person, and I don't have any appreciation for that. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. To gain, gain votes, yeah. So anyway, ready to go on now that I answered that question and I satisfied my selfish, sinful desires. We go to Joel now again, page 761, and we're going to look at verses 12 through 17. And these verses are the last part. I didn't put this on the board again. But these are the last parts of God's judgment 
and his call for them to repent. And so it says there, yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. He's prophesied all these locusts coming in and destroying everything. Return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not return and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a dr drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Okay, so here we have, it's really interesting that uh, this is an appointed scripture reading for Ash Wednesday. Now, why would it be for Ash Wednesday? Okay, it's, it's the really the beginning of a serious, not that we don't do it other way, but a serious endeavor to reflect upon our lives in the light of God's holy word and see our sins, okay? So it's a penitential season, and so he's reminding us here uh, to God's calling us to repent, okay? So he's, he's announced this, this, this uh, devastating destruction of the land uh, but by locusts, and then he says, now notice, he says, uh, return to me with all your heart. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, okay? So you have this call for repentance, and so I just put this on the board. First of all, I didn't want to write it well, because my mind all of a sudden, I'm old, so I, I, I start writing and I forget, so <laughs> anyway. And I, I, I put this on the board, too, because this is tied with last Sunday's, I can't remember which was the sermon or Bible study now. It was, I don't know, it, it doesn't matter. But anyway, it starts out, repenting, of, first of all, is confess the reality of our sinfulness. I think it was in, in Bible study. Confess the reality of our sinfulness. Look at ourselves and say to God, here's where I'm all screwed up. Here's where I'm all messed up. And, 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 and I put behind here what was on the board then. <laughs> See, it is in Bible study. Turn away from self and sin. Remember, Pastor, if, if you were in Bible class, Sunday, he was talking about repentance is turning away from ourself because our self is sinful in thought, in word, in deed. Our self is centered on self, not on God. And so he says, so God, God here is calling us to confess the reality of our sinfulness. Turn from yourself and sin. Secondly, repent means to trust in Christ's redeeming grace. And, and this is from Bible study again. Turn to Christ. Go before the cro uh, cross of Calvary and admit, Lord, you have loved me with a love I don't deserve. Thank you for forgiving me through the blood you shed in my behalf. Okay, and then the last one, seek to walk by the Holy Spirit, not the flesh. And this was the concept of follow me, okay? A truly repentant person does not continue to willingly, willingly live in the sin for which they have repented. It doesn't mean we're not going to sin again. But it's kind of like, I think we talked about this one other week, that it's like a child who say, now, how often am I going to have to forgive you till you really are serious about being sorry? Okay, uh, and so the Lord will forgive us again, but it, it's walking a new life in the spirit of God. That, that is, so those are the three aspects of uh, repentance, okay? Okay. Um, I don't know if you have any comments on that. And we don't, obviously, 
you don't sit there and say, uh, I don't know, some other churches would do this, but after this one, you don't say, well, now you can take communion after we give you a four-week probation. And if your four-week probation, you straighten up, then we'll do this. See, um, yeah. I mean, there's, there's episodes where uh, somebody comes in and they'll say, oh, I, it happened to me once. I, I'm so sorry. I had an affair. And I suppose I can't take communion. Uh, uh, that's why I told, told this person. I said, well, no, you, she, she was sorry. She had stopped. I said, no, you need it now because you need the power of Christ's forgiveness to enable you to live the new life. Yeah. See, great. Good job. See, you got it. There's no probation with Jesus. Sometimes she's got it. <laughs> okay. So, so notice in, in verse 12, return to me with all your heart. So that's what this is encompassing, the whole heart, the, a complete change. We need a complete change because the penitential psalm, you know what the, which is the penitential psalm? 51. And that's where, where David will say, against you, you only have I sinned. And he, he doesn't sit there and, and, and say, hey, if somebody, I wouldn't have sinned except this person over here did this. He didn't do that. Against you, you only have I sinned. And that's where we get, uh, we sang a Sunday. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. The concept here is the, the idea w that the problem with us is the heart. Okay, Matthew 15 says, out of the heart proceed murder, evil thoughts, murders, adultery, da, da, da. It's the heart. And so we need a spiritual heart transplant. Okay, and that's what created me is. That, and it's kind of interesting that we have that in our liturgy after we hear God's word. Oh, boy, if I messed up, create in me a clean heart, oh, God. Okay? And then notice it, it, is, it is something that is uh, uh, serious. I mean, it's not an act because notice he says, re render, re return to me with all your heart. And then it says, goes on, return your hearts and not your garments. Okay? It's not an outward act. It's an inward coming forth to the Lord. Okay? Um, and then return to the Lord because he's gracious. See, that's where he, uh, uh, that comes in. He, he will receive us. Now, the, I guess the question, and I thought I would bring this up, is uh, the last part of verse 13. And he, namely God, relents over disaster. Does he repent over disaster? That's the question. Um, the, the Hebrew word is, no, it's, it's going to be your A. A calm. It's a calm. Okay. A calm. And what it really means is to, um, to alter or to ease. It doesn't mean to repent. Okay, it doesn't mean repent. So it means uh, he, he has directed it somewhere else. So the punishment we deserve, where is it directed? To Jesus. To Jesus. Oh, Isaiah 53, right? Yeah. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Okay, he, so he said, I'm not, I'm not repenting. I am not wrong, but I am directing this to my son. And my son will take the pain, the punishment for all of our sins. So Isaiah 53 is a beautiful example of that, Isaiah, especially verses 5 and 6. Uh, but pointing, saying, God says, Nakam, I have directed. I have eased the punishment you deserve, and I've laid it on my son. Isn't it? Doesn't that give you a I get me tingles. I mean, to be loved that much that uh, he, he spares me for something I rightfully deserve. And see, what?
curiosidad. Yes, but it's not repent. Is that so? That's we have to understand that. Yeah. Well, I know, <laughs> but some people read it that way. <laughs> you know, like, like I've God. God changed his mind. Like his mind wasn't really quite accurate when he did it. He was kind of like you and I. Okay. Do you ever get angry, and then after a while you have to apologize because you got too overheated? Yeah. <laughs> And, and, and so, yeah, so this, is, so this is a redirection. It's an altering, uh, an easing upon us. So because technically, what could have God done to the people at Joel's time? Killed them. The wages of sin is death. I don't have to put up with this. But then, and, and this is where verse 14 comes in, it's a rhetorical question. Who knows whether he, God, will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Now, remember what we said earlier in, about the concept of stewardship and, jo and uh, Joel? God, God had punished the land with the insects, and they could not bring an offering to God. And now he's saying, will God not ease this? so that you once again can bring an offering unto him, okay? And, and so this shows the graciousness of God. Um, I don't know if you have any other comments on that, but that's, uh, that's it. <laughs> okay? Exactly. And that's what he says up in, uh, he doesn't want us to rent our garments he wants us to rend our hearts and what is it uh that path i don't i can't see it's on the right side of my bible but a broken and a contrite heart oh god you will not despise isn't it interesting that what he wants is for us to be broken so that we might be healed and then you well, then and then sometimes this is why things come our way that we might become broken over self so that we will turn to the Lord. He could forget us, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We had an episode once, it's kind of interesting. This lady had uh, lost her ability to walk. Nobody knew why. And she was getting better. And so I was gonna, I was, went up to the hospital that day and I thought she'd be excited. And she had fallen. And she was discouraged again. And I knew her well enough. And I, so we talked. I said, so did God change that you went from joy to sorrow? No. Then did your outlook upon God change? And she had to confess, I was putting my hope in walking, not in God. See, this is the, uh, again, when, it, when we go with our feelings, because Loretta and I are in a tough moment right now in our marriage. We're dealing with a bathtub with leaks. <laughs> 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 and I told her, I told her when we did it, it's a faucet leak, and I told her when it, it, it's one of these dumb knobs. And I, I've done this before, and it's so hard to get it to stop dripping. And we put inner, new innards in yesterday, and she was all excited. We got to put it back together. I said, hey, there's nothing to be excited about yet. <laughs> it's, it's dripping. Not as bad, but it is dripping. Okay. Now, if we base our lives on that, we're at an all-time low right now. Okay. But Jesus has still paid for our sins. He still governs our lives, and he's taking us to heaven. So what's there to be sad about? Okay, because if I'm sad over that drip, then I'm the drip, right? <laughs> okay, anyway. So that's why they always say, 
base your faith not on circumstances, but on the truth of God's word. And, and claim the promise. I, and we don't use that term much. But claim the promises of God. God says, I will work it out all for good. Okay? Um, anyway, enough of that. Okay? So, <laughs> now I want you to also just look at verses 12 or 15 through 17. Now, this is in comparison to chapter 2, verse 1. Two, chapter 2, verse 1 was a wake-up call. Wake up, you guys. This is, con this is prophesied because you have fallen away from me. Wake up. Now, this one, in beginning at 15 through 17, is more like um, the church bell ringing. Okay, the church bell rings. Now, in Missouri, it's not as prevalent today anymore, but in Missouri... If someone, <laughs> a country church, if someone died, they rang the church bell for five minutes. Then they told the bell the number of years the person was old, and then they rang it five more minutes. And so people could hear it in the community, and they could try to figure out who died. <laughs> but then also, on Sunday mornings, half an hour before church started, they rang the church bell. Ah, uh, call to worship. And then at, at, at the time, then they rang the bell again, okay? Well, that, that's this concept here, okay? That's what he's talking about here. The first up one in, in, in chapter 2, verse 1 is a wake-up call. Guys, wake up! Kind of getting shaky on a bed, okay? Now, this is time to go to church. <laughs> you, you've been woke up. So he says here, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast. Okay, so consecrate a fast. Here's the concept of this repentance. We come to church to bring our sins to the Lord. So people who say, well, I'm not going there. That's where sinners congregate. Well, <laughs> you're absolutely right. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. We're coming as sinners. That's why we're going here. We're not going here because we're so good, and we're not going in here to get a checkpoint. We're coming because we have a broken heart that needs healing, okay? It's consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Now, notice the word solemn there. This is, so it's an act of repentance that's serious. It's not something, you, you know, I uh, <laughs> a guy the other day. Was <laughs> he was talking to me. And <laughs> he said, uh, we were in a gymnasium. They had this large rock kind of music on between basketball games, and he said, oh, yeah, that's like some churches. Gee, they get so loud, the music. That's not what it, you know, and some of it, you sit there, it, it's not about us going to church. Like, nah, nah, nah. No, no, I mean, the, uh, the black people, they jive, and that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just talking about where everything is like you're on another level, and there's no problems in the whole world, okay? And you don't talk about sin. You talk about the good that things. Makes you feel bad. That makes you feel bad, yes. Yeah. My wife already tells me that. Okay. No. <laughs> so so this is a solemn it's 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 a time of seriousness. It's a connection with God where God we're gonna hear what God has to say to us, and it's not all going to be comforting, but it is going to lead to comfort. Okay? It's gonna lead to healing. So it's a serious act. And then I want you to notice here who gathers. Yeah, the elders, the children, even nursing infants. Now that's an interesting concept there. Okay, and I, I want to talk a little bit about that just because this is one of the things that uh, people will nail us on. Okay, why, why, why baptize a baby? Okay. So, first of all, why should everybody come to church, even infants? To hear the word of God. And we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay? The concept in Scripture is, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. I've been sinful since I, the day I was born, okay? Because I got out of that, the womb, and I, I looked at myself in the mirror and said, my good looking. No. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you came from par sinful parents. And two sinful parents cannot make a holy child. That's why the virgin birth is so significant. 
okay? So, and then you got in John where uh, John or Jesus is dealing with Nicodemus and he says, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Flesh, self, and sin. Uh, Genesis 8, the intention of man's heart is evil from its youth. Okay? And, and it's interesting. We, we, when you think about it, I, I, well, this is what I always think about. I never had to teach my children to do bad. <laughs> I mean, the very young age, okay, they take a cookie that mom said they shouldn't have, and as they're going uh, out of the kitchen, they're going like this. <laughs> Nobody had to teach them that. They knew it was wrong, okay? We have to teach them good. Evil is just part of our sinful nature. And, and so that's why we baptize children. And I want to I want to look up one verse here because, and I'll share why, but Mark chapter 10, this is on page 846. 846. The, I was asked years ago to go to a Baptist church. This was in Missouri. It was a Sunday night, and they were studying different religions. And uh, so they wanted to study Lutheranism. They called me, so I went over, and they wanted to specifically talk about baptism. And my eyes were open because uh, at the end of the thing, they said, well, you know baptism doesn't work because some of the children fall away. Now, you have to understand, see, this is another doctrine they have that we don't have. Once saved, always saved. You can't fall away. So <laughs> then I said to them, well, haven't you had people in church who have been members for 10, 15 years and then stopped? Yeah, but they really didn't believe. <laughs> Were they baptized? They didn't say, but the, the concept is, the concept to them is, first of all, and, and I asked, a, so I asked a Baptist preacher, because it came in a confirmation class, an adult asked me, well, where, where did we get, where did they get the age of accountability from? And I, so I called a Baptist preacher up in town, and he, he was very nice to me. So when I gave the information, I didn't condemn him. I said, this is the information he gave me. Now, we don't believe this, but I'm not going to condemn him. He gave us, yeah. But he said, we deduce that. It's not found in Scripture. We deduce that because David had a little boy that went to heaven. It never says anything about being baptized or circumcised or saved. And therefore, you are innocent until the age of accountability. So they deduce that. It's not something that he said, very clearly said it's not something we can prove. It's just something we have deduced. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, in Mark chapter 10, I just find this very interesting because the other argument is they will say, see, because people associate confession, confessing, speaking with the word in your mouth, the aspect of faith. Okay? So a baby can't say they believe, so they really can't believe. All right? That's just, I'm not saying that's what they would say. So here's, this is a, from... Um, Mark 10, 13 through 16. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant, very displeased, and said to them, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Now, the picture here, wh when we have a picture of this, what does it look like? You ever see a picture of this? On his lap. But they don't have a baby. The little children here is a Greek word that means an infant child that's still nursing. So the picture is really inaccurate. Okay, he's holding a little child, a baby that's still nursing from his mother's breast or her mother's breast, but 
is still nursing. And he says, that child, be like that child and believe. I'll get to right away. Then I just, this morning when I was going over this again, I thought about, Beretta showed me a thing on, on uh, the computer last night. She's retired. She's on the computer now. <laughs> and <laughs> she, she, said, she said, you got to see, and it was really cute. A grandma came to surprise her little boy, grandson, probably about a year old maybe at the most. And he didn't know. And so the dad's holding, comes out of the patio door. He sees grandma. <gasps> Happy, <laughs> claps like this. You think he believes that that's somebody he knows? You better believe he does. Can he say, oh, grandma, grandma, grandma. No. <laughs> but he knew, right? He knew. He, uh, infant knows when mom or dad's holding, especially mom, uh, calms down right away. Yes. OK, go ahead. <laughs> Yes, 100 A.D., uh, yes, this ba far back as 100 A.D., they found catacombs uh, that had the uh, water poured on their head, too, not just infants, but pouring water on their head. See, because that's the other thing that they would say, yeah. we're, not a, we ha we don't, we're not baptized yet because we haven't been all the way under water. So did you ever hear the story of the Baptist and the Lutheran? Did you hear the story of the Baptist? Yes. Baptist and Lutheran are talking about this, and so the Lutheran says, so uh, if I go up to my knees in the water, Am I baptized? No. If I go up to my waist? No. If I go up to my shoulders? No. If I go up just over my nose and hold my breath, am I baptized? No. So then the only thing that matters is the forehead. Did too. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. You're right. You're it, right. And and it's really my oldest son. He was singing the liturgy because you know you used to just have the same format, and he was singing the whole liturgy by the age of three. And and they you just you know you sit there even now, our little girl grandkids will say so. Uh, Loretta wears a nice cross and she so, so who who died there Jesus. Why did he go there? For my sins. And the interesting thing about little kids is they don't question. They accept. They accept. And that's why the Lord says we should have a childlike faith. God says this is the way it is. Can he? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So anyway. Yeah, there are comments on that. So this is so. So what it's reminding of us of in in this whole concept is uh, going back to where is that uh, end of verse sixteen in Joel again two, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. In the church service, we are coming to meet the bridegroom. And in in Christie's movie uh, thing that she had, you see. The bridegroom is giving us the cup of salvation. He's giving us his true body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. And so that's why this call is come together at God's house. Okay. Um, yeah. So one other verse let's look up here just because I think it's important. Well, they're all important. That was a stupid question. Excuse me. <laughs> Oh yeah, but but uh, <laughs> oh, you, thanks for helping me. I appreciate that. I need all the help I can get up here. Okay, Hebrews ten, Hebrews ten, uh, ten oh seven. This is familiar, but I just think it's good for us because again, now what you understand what he's doing? This is the last part of the call of repentance. He's wake up. This is why this stuff's coming your way. Now, come together to the Lord's house, okay? Consecrate a fast, okay? Meet the bridegroom. And so in, in Hebrews chapter 10, um, let me just read that. I didn't mark it here, okay. Hebrews oh, 10, 22 to 24. Um, well, let's just start at 19 through 20, 22 or 24. 
Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places of the blood of Christ, by the blood of Christ, okay, so the church isn't really any holier than any other place as of itself. It becomes holy because that's where Christ comes down to be among us. If you remember, um, and in fact, I use that when we, the St. Paul's built their new church, Jacob's ladder, you remember it was designated as a, the gateway to heaven because that's where God and man came together. So this is a holy place because this is where God, through his word and his sacraments, comes to be and touch his people. So therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, okay? And what happened when at the, with the curtain? It was torn at the crucifixion when he died. No more separation, okay? So, and, and that's interesting because that's where we have the communion rail. That's where the curtain would be now. You know? So when it's torn, now we can come and receive his body and blood. Okay, um, that is through the flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near, notice, with a true heart, sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed pure with, with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day drawing near. And so it is a holy place, a consecrated place, a place of repentance, a place where we can sincerely meet with our Lord and gather with all the family of God for encouragement and strengthening. All right, any, any comments on that? So, and this is one of the interesting things I kind of wonder about, and I'm not saying it's bad, but seeing, I don't know that the attendance has ever gone all the way back up since the pre-COVID times. And now people have gotten used to watching it TV or on our, and we tape it, and I'm not saying that's bad. Please understand, I'm not saying it's bad. But it's also interesting because, well, you don't have it here yet, but many churches, they now you can uh, give your offerings electronically. So they don't have to go to church even to drop their offering off, okay? And then unfortunately, and this was an issue that arose, I don't know if you're aware of this, some Missouri Synod churches were giving communion over the television. You would set up your altar, and he would consecrate the elements on there, and then they, and that was mixed. Not that every, but the all Lutherans mixed it, but that was mixed because that was not considered. Well, true. The other thing that I kind of questioned about all that is, we don't expect people to clean up from the wrong doing. So shouldn't the bad thing have just crossed the line? Well, that's not exactly what the means. <laughs> no. Right, right. And, and so technically, and I, before I retired, I wanted to write a, uh, something on the importance of Christian fellowship, but it was still dealing with COVID. It was just getting over the COVID stuff. But this is, this is why it's important that we converse with one another and share with one another God's things on Sunday morning. We're here to encourage one another. And I would, this is when I always nailed the, the uh, people at St. Paul's though. I said, I, you have offended me immensely. When I am distributing communion and I have to wait for the other element to be distributed and I can't hear the words of the communion hymn. When I can't hear the words of the communion hymn, you are failing to feed my faith with the word of God and that's a sin. Think about that. Our singing is a witness to our faith. When I sing, I witness to the next person, okay? This is all important, you know, it's like, oh, I just can't sing. Well, maybe you can't sing, but at least you can say the words, right? But it is, it, the whole aspect is encouraging one another. It's fellowship, okay? Or getting together and then 
like you told me about uh, Gisla and this morning. See, that's encourage, just encouraging one another in, in the things of God. And, and that's, it's a big thing. And uh, it, it's not about, and I, I like sports too, it's not about talking about whether Purdue beat Northwestern in an overtime game last night. I know they did. <laughs> Somebody's a... Yeah, right, 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 yes. So, so it's uh, encouraging. We are to encourage one another, okay? I'm not, see, it's like I, I'm not there just for me. I am there to be bear witness to others and to share with others the faith we have. And even questions. I mean, when you have a question, other people have the same question. <laughs> but we don't want to ask, but it, we all have questions. Yes, yeah. Well, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, yeah, that would be okay. That's no. That's a part. And I and I spend a lot of time when I come back from communion. I love the uh, after communion prayer in the front of the hymnal, and I I I go through that real slowly, um, because it, it's a re, a big reflection. And so yes, I'm not saying you've got to sing right away. I'm not. No. 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 Let's not make that. No. 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 <laughs> Let's not make this law, but you know what I mean. You can sit back down, and and, and at St. Paul's they have more people that take or take communion too. It's the last law, but and you sit there, and if you sit in the pew, and then you you you've done your prayer and meditation, and then what verse are they on? And uh, many times, if I'm in the balcony at St. Paul's, I watch the organist's mouth because she she mouths the words. And I can try to figure out. But if I can't, think about that. If you can't figure out where everybody is after you're done meditating, thank you very much. I appreciate that. If you're done meditating, what? <laughs> you're singing it around then, right? <laughs> they are. They are too. Yes, yes. And I mean, you always, you have to reflect on yourself and because and, and so, sometimes you may cry, okay, or that's okay, you know, think something hits you or um, wasn't the last Sunday we sang, let us ever walk with Jesus? Well, that was a uh, wedding hymn in my first wife and I's wedding ceremony. It was a prayer, let us ever walk with Jesus, yes. So that has special meaning, you know, okay. Any other comments? Okay, very good. 17. So then it addresses the pastors here. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. And then what they're doing is they're praying for the people. Spare your people, O Lord. So the priests are, are, are also, in, excuse me, in Scripture, to be praying for the Lord. And he's asking them, he, in their prayer, he's supposed, they're supposed to recount the promises of God. So that the, the idea here at the end, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, is that other nations are watching. And this is, we have this example in scripture where uh, Moses, for example, when the golden calf was built and he prayed for his people in Exodus 32 and he said, Lord, don't destroy them now. What are the people of Egypt gonna make of this? <laughs> okay. They would, they would say, oh, your God's nothing, see? And so he used that. And um, also in Numbers 14, about entering uh, uh, Canaan, you know, oh, you can't enter Canaan, it's too, you know, it's, it's bad and stuff. And Lord, do not punish the people because of their questions, okay? Uh, because other, the world is gonna look at that and turn it into a negative. So pleading on the case of the promises of God, you said you were gonna give them the land of Canaan, get them there <laughs> okay all right anything else how you doing Marilyn you look good today you you look good every everybody looks good every day and I had I've had I've had my eyes checked okay well you you know no, no, that's a, it's, 
I, I don't know where it got connected from, but what's, this is what's interesting to me about that. So what do they call the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday? Fat Tuesday. Fat Tuesday. So I stock up <laughs> on Tuesday <laughs> so that on Wednesday I can give something up. And then the day after Lent's done, is, was that Dingus Day or something like that? <laughs> now I go back and stock up again, you know? It's like I've done this little, no, it's, it's, a discipline is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with a discipline. I get that, yes, yeah. I, Good answer. That's a good answer. Yeah. Yes. But I always have to like, like at New Orleans, that's a big festival the day before. I mean, really. So it kind of reminds me of Kenny Chesney's song. He it was, uh, I, I want to go to heaven. And I had the kids evaluate that in confirmation class because I want to teach them discernment. And in that, it sounds great. I want to go to, but not, but not right now, which that sounds like us sometimes. But then he's got in there, well, I'm going to throw an extra $20 in the collection plate so I can party tonight. Well, wait a minute. That says I'm paying off God so I can sin. Okay. No, you're not expected to, but again, look, just think about what we've talked about with fasting before. It, it wouldn't be the giving up, but you, instead of, I don't know, let's just say, uh, I give up a dessert. So when the dessert time comes, then you do additional Bible study and prayer. That's pleasing fasting. And I, but I think the other thing, you have to understand, I, there is something important, so I'm not going to say you give somebody giving something up is bad because it's important that we can discipline our body, right? And and giving something up can be a discipline of the body. It, it's like you know, say, well, I'm not addicted to anything, but I boy, I need a cup of coffee in the morning. <laughs> See, well, that doesn't. So you're really addicted to something if you have to have that cup of coffee. If I have to have a shower to get going. I can be addicted. I mean, you can be addicted to anything, and 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 the, the Lord is tell, does teach us in Scripture we are supposed to discipline our bodies, and so if that's the process of helping us to dis discipline our body, you know, not gain it, it's nothing to do with gaining God's favor or being a better person. Just disciplining our bodies. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So, I know. I, you know, my one son. He uh, he, he likes to give up coke for. Lent. He knows he shouldn't drink it anyway, but anyway, um, it is good, but um, <laughs> oh, drinking period? Okay. All, well, <laughs> I'm going to remember to, I'm going to invite you out to go for it. <laughs> I'll go, I invite you out during Lent for a drink. <laughs> no. no, but even there, see, that's, a, but that's, it's, it's a, it's a discipline. That's, there's nothing wrong. Right, right, yeah, yeah, you know, but we are supposed to restrain ourselves from certain things, you know, even like our speech, we should, uh, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, 
And even what Rick is talking about, so it's interesting because it helps you to check uh, is, is drinking controlling me or am I controlling drinking? Because I, I dealt with a, a while back with a, somebody, a, a member contacted me from St. Paul's and there was a guy was, and he only got drunk on Friday night. It was a non-member. And then his marriage got bad and his wife told, called me and I said, I told him, I said, you're an alcoholic. He said, I only got drunk on Friday nights. I said, you can be a controlled alcoholic. I, I, you, pe people can function as alcoholics. I mean, that's, that, that's not a, because that was his, and so he did learn to give that up. And I'm not saying you're an alcoholic, but I'm just saying, <laughs> there, <laughs> there, there, I mean, I, we had one drink last night. We don't have a drink often, but we had a drink last night just to, right? After we got done with the bathtub, that's not this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, well, okay, I'm going to get off the topic here, but I don't understand <laughs> if but vodka doesn't have a smell or taste, right? Well, I do, but you can't smell it on your breath. Oh, it does have a taste. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right, that answers that. I always wondered, I thought if it doesn't taste, it doesn't smell, then why would you add it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Verse 17 now, um, or verse 18, it says there, now we're going, now we're going into the part about uh, Christ and forgiving us and the new life going on, okay? Uh, that doesn't mean the, the, uh, the insects have not yet come, but they are going to be coming. But he says then in verse 18, then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. And the word jealous is a, is a difficult word for us because we generally associate jealousy with sin. Um, but the Greek word there, or Hebrew word, pardon me, I don't know what they do with this, is Ghana. Q would be like Ghana. And what it means is zealous. You know, now think about that. You're zealous for your children. You want what's best for your children. You want to do everything that's best for your children. And then you got to be sure that you're not so gracious that they don't learn anything. So that's like God, okay. But this is, the Lord is zealous for his people because he created them. He wants them to be redeemed and, and, and he will redeem them. And he wants to restore the land to the way he wanted it to be. So he is zealous for his people to repent of their sins, to draw near, and to make sure there is that he is their Lord. Um, he promises here, um, the Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, oil, verse 19, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northern far from you and drive him into the parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise for he has done great things. So here he's talking about uh, reestablishing a fruitful land. Okay, wine, oil, grain again. He's talking about protecting his people from foreign threats. And he also speaks of the fact that he is going to get rid of these locusts. Okay, and the the the, uh, the desolate to land to the north would be the Arabian s Desert, to the east would be the Dead Sea, and to the west would be the Mediterranean Sea. So he says, "I'm going to get rid of all this because I love you." 
You have heard my voice, and I have pity on my people. And it's, it's so, it is so amazing to think that God doesn't recount our sins. The, and actually, the biggest problem we have with forgiveness, actually, in many instances, is not God's forgiveness as it is forgiving ourselves. Yeah, and it's to believe that that, that that is possible. I mean, it's like when Jesus looks at us, he wouldn't see if that when we if that was the our, our the whiteboard was our lies. He wouldn't see any writing on that. He wouldn't even see a smudge mark because he's removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. And can you imagine, we could go, we could die recounting our sins, and we get to God, God in heaven, and he says, what sin? <laughs> That's a, it's amazing. It's just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, 20, 21 through 26. It reads, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. Talking of man and animal. The tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for vindic your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. And uh, verse 26, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. So now he's talking about how he responds to his people, okay, and to the land, to everything. And I want to spend a little time and, and go through a few verses just to, to for our, for getting, uh, get, getting, giving us a feel too. Of He says here, first of all, for example, he says twice, 21 and 22, fear not. Fear not. That is, <laughs> that's an interesting thing for us never be afraid and so I just I'm going to just quote these verses and if you want to write them down it's fine but we don't have to be afraid because God is our shield he is our protector uh, in, uh, in Genesis 50, 15 verse 1 he writes after these things the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision fear not Abraham I am your shield your reward shall be very great. And Deuteronomy 3, you shall not fear them, for it is the Lord your God who fights for you. So here he's saying, my army was these, these locusts, but I have sent them away now. I am your shield and I'm your protector. And never again will this devastation come upon your land like this. Second thing he, the, the, we think about, we don't have to be afraid, is he promises to be with us. Okay? And it, talk about childlike faith. This is so interesting. When we were, we had lived in Missouri, and our, uh, we were driving back, and we were in the middle of bad weather. Tornado warnings were out, and it was dark. We had an 11-hour trip, and uh, the one was real little, and... and uh, Jerry and I were a little bit nervous because you couldn't see tornado clouds or anything and there was no place to turn off. And he said, you don't have to be afraid. Jesus is with us. Clap the right. Oh, boy, Pastor. Bang, oh. Several years later, now he was in second grade, same situation. He's up nervous. And we say, well, don't not be afraid Jesus is with us. He literally looks around the van and says, I can't see it. The difference between childlike faith and human. Okay, very interesting, okay? We quoted him back, and now I can't find him anywhere. So 
but he's with us. Here we have a, an example would be Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 6 to 8. Uh, Moses is speaking to Judah, and he says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. So we don't have to be afraid because the Lord is always there. And that reality is found in Psalm 30, 23, verse 4, where it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And I always have told people, well, we talk a little bit about this after class the other day, but um, I, I, I get it when people want to be there when their loved one's going to die. But sometimes it's a very long process. And I just sit there and remind them, you can be there, but you can't go with them when they take their final breath. But Jesus can. And Jesus says, I'm going to take that person and I'm going to carry them to heaven. And that's all we need to know is that when, when they depart this life, what does Paul say? Uh, to depart this, uh, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To depart this life is far better. Okay? So we've got, he's with us. Then also, uh, the concept of fear not because he will provide for us. And that's what he's talking about here. He's going to restore stuff. So um, in, the, in the wilderness, uh, their final month, they're, they're just about to enter the land of Cana in Deuteronomy 2.7. Uh, it's in the wilderness journey, and the Lord says to them, For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. These 40 years the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. Now, it's really interesting because God says you have lacked nothing. What did the people think? They lacked a lot of stuff. And the concept is, the, the, when it's, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in need of anything. You know, when I was a little boy, I thought, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Why wouldn't I want the Lord as my shepherd? I know. <laughs> yes. But, but it's also saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I will not need anything. It doesn't mean my want, because my wants are selfish and sinful again. See, it, it's kind of like, uh, what is that court case now that that lady or Trump, she got like 83 million. I don't know what to do with 83 million dollars. I don't know. You know I, I this, These things are just bo mind boggling to me. Um, but anyway, um, I lack nothing. I got everything I need. And so the, you got the account of Elijah. Remember, he was out, out in the wilderness. There was um, um, uh Starvation, not starvation, yeah, uh, what do I want to call it? No, famine, thank you. There was a famine. Who provided the food and brought it to a raven? A raven, of all things, a raven. You know, now I, I would figure if I was starving, I hope my wife would come with something, but this is a bird, and a bird who would eat, eat stuff that was dead. What is this? But this is God providing, okay? So he needed nothing. Then he gets there's another one. It's still the famine. He goes to the widow of Zarephath. Just enough for one last meal. But every day there was just enough for one last meal. God took care of him. The feeding of the multitude. Okay? Five loaves. And I, I looked this up. In John, it's very specific. It says five small loaves two small fish. Because I thought, well, you know, what if it was a big honking? You know? <laughs> 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 but he, it, does, it doesn't say it in the other accounts. I was just going to check. It doesn't say it in the other three Gospels. But in John, it says small, small bread, small fish. And it fed 5,000 men, not counting women, women and children. And you got 12 baskets of food left over. Well, that does not happen when my family gets together for Thanksgiving. Oh, huh? Well, yeah. <laughs> they can eat. Okay. Uh, anyway, 
I'm glad. They're, they're healthy. Okay, now, yes. I said. Yeah. Yeah, see, well, that's, and that, that, that's probably, we have this, we're like a cow. The grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. And we're reaching through the fence and say, hey, better grass is over there. And then you get electrocuted and, you know, whatever. Uh, I don't have a word. But, but that's why the Lord continually speaks about remembering. Remember, remember, remember. And for me, I look at this, this is how I look at it. I, when I came into this world, I was stark naked. And no matter what I have accumulated, God's given it to me, but in the end, I go out stark naked. Well, I guess he has some things to hold on to put on, but you know what I mean. You, you have nothing in the beginning, nothing at the end. You know? and, and God, right, and it, it does, so, you know, but God says, remember how I have blessed you. Rem I mean, did I pick Christian parents? No. I was blessed with Christian parents. I was blessed with a good Christian family. I was blessed and all throughout my life. God's, and sometimes I didn't make the best of decisions and God got it all right anyway. And uh, you just sit there and you marvel. You know, you, all you can, it, but if you, have, if you remember, but when we forget, because, you know, um, we start complaining like, you forgot that you got food in the wilderness. You just didn't like the food you got all the time. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so you've got the, for one thing God's teaching us, fear not. So he, this is a lesson for us. This is applying it to today. Fear not. No matter what goes on, fear not. I will provide for you. I will care for you. I will protect you. And I will always be with you. Secondly, he says in, in Joel, be glad and rejoice. Okay, for the Lord has done great things. Be glad, O children of Israel, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you these things. And it goes on. So he wants us to be glad and rejoice. So now how do we do that in difficult times? And he goes back to kind of Rick's question again. And one of the things we have to remember Turning to Romans chapter 5, this is on page 942 in my Bible, Romans 5, and it's, this is a principle, and I, I, I so was thankful, um, I don't know if I ever told you that, this last year I, I had uh, this cross country coach, he was my cross country coach, track coach and speech teacher, and he called me up. He's in California, he's got cancer now. They called me up, he saw my name in the Lutheran witness under appoint or elected circuit visitor. So he called me up just to see how I was doing. And uh, I thought that was, that was such a neat thing, uh, but, but the, the whole concept of, he was a, a very inspirational, and, and for me, running was like faith. He had these things. He said, now you skip, okay, you skip practice a day. It'll take you two days to make it up. Your muscles either get stronger or weaker. They aren't going to stay the same, okay? Uh, we, he, he had us running hills, just up and down hills and up and down hills and up and down hills. He, all these drills he had. Um, it was a tough guy, but it made us better runners. So anyway, Romans chapter 5 on my Bible, 942, be, be glad and rejoice, always, in all circumstances. Here's why. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're at peace with God because Jesus has redeemed us, declared us righteous. We are his forgiven and redeemed children. Through him we have obtained, also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice 
Heaven is our home. More than that, we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And this is where he worked us hard so that when the race came, we could endure it. And endurance produces character. You never, this is one of the things I learned across, you never give up. You're not tired. You just keep going. You, you got a race to run. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so what God says is rejoice in all circumstances because I'm building you into my child. And there's passages, I think we looked at them up before already, but where it says to reach the full measure. Okay, so we're, we're still not at the full measure. We won't get to the full measure until we get to heaven. But he's always building us up. He's always helping us to see something. So, you know, Loretta and I rejoice in the dripping faucet <laughs> that you have water coming into the house. <laughs> rejoice, that, rejoice that you have each other, that you can share the burden of life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so and then and then we always rejoice because oh, wh when is the wedding feast going to occur when's the real huh in heaven okay this the th the lord's supper is a to what is to come just wait till the lord comes and he and we see him face to face and he says Here's my body and my blood that I shed for you. Now you're here. Oh, man. Woo okay. Yeah. Peace of the Lord. Yep. Okay. Well, I guess we'll, you have any other comments? So this is, so we stopped with hope again. That's a good, I like to stop there. You know, uh, uh, one, I'll just read one final pa passage from Isaiah. 61. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. You know? Amen. So we can, we're going to be standing in the presence of the bridegroom one day. It's our clothing. Yes, we will be out. Yes. Yeah, and that... This, this, that just reminds me, this, this part here of, of repentance reminds me of, I was a little boy, and I was, I was a very active little boy. My dad used to say, Roger, do hus kind setzfleisch. You have no sitting flesh. And I remember, you know, back then, this is back in the 50s, you, you dressed up for church. And my uncle had gotten me a suit and a tie and a little hat. And, but my folks would sit there and say, Roger, you're dressed for church. Don't get it dirty before we get there. And I always think of that. God says, I have put you, I've dr dressed you with the robe of righteousness. Don't get it dirty. <laughs> and we do. But he's a good dry cleaner. <laughs> okay. Let, let us close with prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that whatever is before us, we know that you go with us. And we know that whatever we shall encounter, you will work it all out for our eternal well-being. So help us, O Lord, to trust in thee fully and to live for thee, to thy honor and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ, our living and reigning Savior.